But, uh, you know, one of the great themes throughout this fellowship has been the idea that the Torah portion is a blueprint for our times, that the Parsha illuminates the events that are unfolding both in our personal lives, but also in the um, on what's unfolding in the in the world. And so, you know, a cute example I thought I would start with my piece with that would demonstrate this principle would be one thing that happened this week that Jeremy actually made a powerful viral video about regarding the Washington rally. You remember, did anyone see that? Raise your hand if you saw Jeremy's video. It really got out there. It was very good. It was a very, very powerful video. Every word was perfect there in my mind. Anyways, uh, that rally was alluded to in this week's Torah portion. And if you know where I'm going with this, raise your hand. So Jacob successfully receives Isaac's a blessing, and he is told to flee to Beit Lavan, to Laban's house. Now, the definition of Laban's name, Lavan, is white, meaning that Jacob was indeed sent to Beit Lavan, to the White House. And the very same week that the children of Israel, that Jacob's children in the nation of Israel, converged on the White House. So that happened, and I thought that that was a cute way we could uh, we could start. But this idea of the Torah in general and the Torah portion of the week in specific, shining a light of context and understanding to our times, goes infinitely deeper. So let's start by looking at one very telling verse that I think opens up an entire world of understanding for us, a whole, a whole world, particularly for us in this fellowship. So after many years of Rebecca being barren, the sages say actually exactly it was 20 years, um, Isaac and Rebecca both pray to Hashem and they finally conceive and Rebecca is pregnant. And then, well, let's look inside at chapter 25, verse 22. Tetsu habanim bekirba, v'tamar imken the children struggled within her and she said, if so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire of Hashem. So Rebecca is feeling this struggle inside of her between Esau and Jacob. And, uh, you know, for many years now, I've reflected on this idea, because as we know, Esau is the father of Rome, of the West, which geographically is Europe and America, but even more so on a spiritual, philosophical, and, and ideological level, Esau is the father of replacement theology which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. And for those of you who aren't, standing on one leg, replacement theology is the idea that took root thousands of years ago that Hashem has rejected his covenant with Israel in favor of Esau and Christianity. And this very perverse idea has been the root and the foundation of unimaginable persecution and murder of Jews throughout history, really cumulatively far greater than what we saw on October 7th. And I personally started seeing this verse in a very different light in my personal encounter with the Christian world many years ago. Because throughout the years, I've seen tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of Christians going through exactly the same struggle within their souls. Now, keep in mind, I'm looking at this from the outside, so I don't know that I can really testify to this, but this is what I've seen. I'd, I'd be very interested to hear from some of you in this fellowship who are Christians or somewhere around there. I know the definitions are sort of getting old lately. But um, but just so that a quick disclaimer, you know, we're family here and we're committed to speaking the truth with each other, even potentially controversial subjects. And this could be one of them. So please know my heart that I love all of you. And if any of you uh, want to speak up or share your feelings, I, I would love to hear that. But anyways, I'm going to go on. I see Christians today going through the same inner struggle between the Jacob within and the Esau within, meaning within themselves. And the reason I say this is because according to my understanding and my personal observations, I've come to see Christianity as in essence a mixture between Jacob, which is Judaism, meaning the Torah itself, as Christianity does believe in the divine origin of the Torah, right? It's called the Old Testament. Um, and uh, But there are also elements of Esau within conventional Christianity, Catholicism, I think, in, in, in particular, as there are also, you know, pagan ideas that have become infused in Christianity as well, whether it's, uh, you know, certain elements of Christmas or Easter, which, in my understanding, 
uh, have pagan origins to them. And, we, you know, we can get deeper into that another time because I intentionally don't want to overfocus on the theology part of things, but rather on the deeper spiritual implications of it. Because I've come to see that the, the true gauge, what I believe is the true gauge of whether each individual Christian is refining the Esau out of themselves and embracing and identifying with Jacob or refining the Jacob out of themselves and identifying and embracing with Esau is whether they stand with Israel during these times. That's far more telling of the true condition of their soul than whether they celebrate Christmas or Easter. As some of the greatest friends of Israel and the Jewish people that I know, people that I love dearly with all my heart, celebrate both of them. So I don't want to get into the ritual and theology of it. It's really more a heart issue. And so on the deepest level, if a Christian stands with Israel, I believe that that means that they are choosing the Jacob within themselves, that they are, the, the, you know, they're seeking a, uh, you know, a, with a passionate thirst. I've just seen over the years this passionate thirst that so many Christians have uh, to connect with and understand the, the Jewish roots of their own faith. And I'm seeing that more strongly than ever during these times when so many so many around the world are turning their backs on Israel, even in the right-wing conservative world in which so many Jews have come to believe that support for Israel is a given. So many of them are made wedges. Wedges are being put in there from, you know, Tucker Carlson, Joe Rogan, Candace Owens. It's really happening very much. And I'm speaking to my conservative friends in America. They don't know what to do with themselves. They're so their their idols are being shattered also. And, you know, so I, I want to give a few examples of what I'm talking about here, because considering the unbelievably strong contrast that we're seeing today in this war between light and darkness, between good and evil, between Israel and Hamas, so many Jews, like I said, are recoiling in shock at the isolation of Israel and the isolation of the Jewish people from all sides. And so those that are standing up and speaking out for Israel um from the nations of the world are being focused on are being highlighted and are, are deeply appreciated by the jewish world by the entirety really of the jewish world in my own family group in which i have family from around the world countries around the world they're religious they're secular they're right and some are even a little bit left still they're taking great comfort in what uh what i'm about to show you now the video i'm about to show you i can't remember whether i showed it to you before but if i did I'm showing it to you again because it just made me feel good. And uh, it, it's of the Maori tribe. Did I show you this yet? Hopefully not. Anyways, we are, uh, th this Maori tribe, or now they're clearly Christians, and they're standing opposite a group of Hamas protesters performing something called a haka, which looks very much like a pre-war psych-out dance. And they're doing it with all their souls. You got to see it. <laughs> My cousins were like, I never had anyone have a perform a, a haka for me before. And, you know, like, I think that the uh, Hamas protesters were like, from the river to the sea, like they were just, I think the wind was just taken out of their sails there. Um, and, uh, and it just, the fact that there was like no pushback on them, I think says as much about the courage and conviction of the Maori as it does about the inherent cowardice of the Hamas activists. Let's see, you know, rushing on them. So that went viral and all of a sudden, you know, my family and pretty much every Jew I know has this newfound affection and love for the Maori. So uh, so one of the, uh, by the way, Maori actually means Maor is like an illumination. 
a source of light, which is a really beautiful idea. And he was one of the most powerful examples of the remnant of the nations that is fiercely standing with Israel, is that of the famous cowboys. You guys know what I'm talking about. Have you heard of these guys? Of course you have. Everybody's heard of these guys. I'm like, they just came to Israel and now they're like international sensations. I don't know anyone in the Jewish world who hasn't heard of them. And the story uh, with these cowboys started a few weeks ago when they were, you know, the world is increasingly turning on Israel more and more and more. And there were even some Jews that were fleeing the country out of fear for what's in store. There were. There were really Jews that were, I'm out of here right now. I don't know if what happened in Gaza is going to happen to the whole country. Really, that was a real fear that was happening. And I don't think anyone was judging anyone at this time. As a matter of fact, that's how I got my two dogs that serve very little function other than entertaining my children to no end. And so I'm really sort of stuck with them. And now one of them is pregnant. And the, all I wanted them to do was to bark when someone comes near. Just bark. Nope. Nope. They're not going to do it. Unless it's another dog or a fox or something. Then they'll bark. But anyway, so I'm stuck with these dogs now. Um, and uh, what was I talking about? Talk about ADD. Anyways... So uh, so they were Jews fleeing the country, and I got them from one of these families that was fleeing the country. That's the connection. Anyways, as this was happening, someone snapped a picture at the airport that's been just going around the world, and it's a picture of these cowboys in the airport that are not fleeing Israel to the safety and serenity of their homes in Montana. No, they are on their way into Israel to stand with us and support us in whichever way they could. And that's the picture of them. So everyone is contacting me, my friends, my family, trying to find out who they are, because they assume for some crazy reason that I would know them. Um, and it seems like everybody just wanted a piece of these poor guys. And then our friends in Hayovel uh, put out this video that they had been found, and they were introducing themselves. My name is uh, Here's John the video. Floker, and I'm from Montana. I'm Ezekiel Strain, and I'm from Montana. Hey, y'all, I'm Luke Hutzler, and I'm from Huntsville, Arkansas. My name's Yosef, I'm from Montana, and I'm here to serve Israel. here to serve Israel any way we can during their hard time here and their struggle against Hamas just out in the West Bank, Judea and Samaria, just um, serving the people whatever way we can help. So. You gotta love them. You don't even know them, you gotta love them. And, and so anyway, why was everybody contacting me? Because they wanted to invite them over for a Shabbat and show their gratitude to them. They, they wanted to meet them in person. And I think, I think to ensure that they were real, you know, in this past Shabbat, that's exactly what happened. They were hosted in the Judean community of Ephrat, which is one of the most prominent settlements in Judea. And people were fighting with each other over who would have the great privilege of hosting them in their homes. Because, you know, the Abrahamic hospitality thing is a real thing, particularly in Judea, across the board. Anyway, so they were hosted in the Jewish community of Efrat, and they were so in demand, people so badly wanted to meet them, that Motzei Shabbat, Saturday night, after Shabbat, they were hosted in one of the biggest, one of the largest synagogues in the community. And as you can see, there was standing room only. Look at these pictures. Standing room only. Here they are. These, these poor guys, they're like, I don't imagine that they've had oratory classes and lessons and public speaking they were just coming to like prune some vines and do whatever they could and here they are like international sensations but um god doesn't always give you a heads up sometimes you're just there and i just heard that the response was overwhelming and people were just so inspired and uplifted by what they had to say and all the fears and doubts by the way that a very small group of loud people were spreading that these cowboys were missionaries with sinister motivations and evil intent. I just was so happy that they had an opportunity to speak because that was just summarily put to rest. You know, that st the rumors started spreading and then you hear them and you just, who you are speaks even louder than what you say. And the simple beauty, sincerity, tamim, you know, that's what God tells us, tamim to you, Michelle, you should be innocent before the Lord. There's just a certain truth and purity and innocence. And uh, so he, by one of my good friends, here's the testimony that he gave about it. He sent this to me. He said, whoever said 
the cowboys or missionaries couldn't be farther from the truth. These guys are just here because they love us and believe stronger than many Jews that we are Hashem's chosen people. And this is where we're supposed to be. And those who bless us will be blessed. It was amazing meeting them and hearing them speak in a fraud over Shabbat. It's, it's, it's so simple. So many Israelis that I meet when I talk about, you know, Christian love for Israel and non-Jews are like, was, most of the time the response is like a conditioned one. Like, oh yeah, according to their whole theology, they want us to come back. So then Jesus will come again and then we'll all die. And that whole thing is going to happen. And it's just some like abstract theology. I'm like, I'm sure there are those that do believe that. I know that that's true, but that is not the motivation of the people that I know that just have a love for Israel, just just to Genesis 12, 3, those who bless Israel will be blessed. And just that inner compass, moral compass in your heart that you just know is right and true. And um, anyways, that Israelis are open to hear that. They just, you know, some ways they want to hear that. They don't want to hear that these incredible friends of Israel have these sinister motivations. And it just, it's a shame. It's a shame. But you see, there's a a refinement process, you know, that we've been talking about here in the Christian world that's been a journey. It's a, it's a journey of, of truth, and it's a journey of discovery. And I mean a journey of truth, meaning you have to have a heart that is seeking truth. They say that emet, truth is God's seal. And if you're seeking that truth and you're willing to go wherever it takes you, even if into no man's, spiritual no man's land, well, that's often where you end up when you follow God's truth in a spiritual no man's land, and that can be a scary place to be. But ultimately, that's where we are here together, and that leads you to, to the Holy Land. Anyways, all of that work that I've seen happening with the Wallers, with so many of you, with so many Christians that are on this journey has really been, I believe, for right now, because the whole world is able to see where each and every person is falling here. And it's inspiring to see because, you know, indeed, there is a line in the sand, and the line is no less than the line between Jacob and Esau, between those who stand with the God of Israel and those who stand against the God of Israel. And I, I know this is a little bit longer than most clips, but I just wanted to play it for you right here. It's not the end of the fellowship. I still have one to share with you, so hold tight. But I wanted at this point to play for you a song um, that was composed and performed by my beloved friends, the Wallers, which I've watched many times over the years. And I think it was recorded then. I think it was recorded seven years ago for this moment right now. And so I want I want uh, to share that with you. There's a battle raging over a people and a land Will you rage with the nations Or will you stand and say i 
I will bless those who bless you. And I will curse those who curse you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. He remembers his covenant forever, the word which he has commanded for a thousand generations. We, we believe, believe in the covenant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In the sand, where will you stand? 